Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. She's India's longest serving deputy chairman of the Rajya Sabha. She's a woman, she's a Muslim and she's North Indian. For many people that makes her an ideal candidate for the vice presidency. But what's her response? Here to answer that question as well as others on the issue of women's reservation is Najma Heptullah. Dr. Heptullah, later in this interview, I want to explore with you your response to whether you are going to be vice president. But first, let's talk about the critical issue of women's reservation. When you became an MP in 1980, yeah. you were against women's reservation. Today, you're in favor of it. Why have you changed your mind? See, I thought that uh, as I had fought my way up in life without any reservation, um, for a seat, of course, against the reservation in the minds of men, uh, because there is always a bias against women. Uh, even if you look at a small thing, if a woman is driving a car and if she makes a mistake, say, oh, a woman is driving a car. If a man makes many more mistakes, nobody will comment in such a way. Oh, a man is driving a car, he's bound to make a mistake. You know, these kind of mindsets were there. So I was not in favor of preservation. I won't say I was against. I was not in favor of it because I thought that we should make it ourselves. Women should be doing it themselves. So By you didn't want a backdoor entrance? Uh, it is not a backdoor entrance. It's a way of getting people into politics. But then, uh, then I realized in all 17 years I've been in parliament. I'm very active in the international parliamentary associations. Uh, both Commonwealth and Inter-Parliamentary Union of 135 countries. And I studied it and we had a research done on it internationally. And we found the India's 7.2, 7.5% representation now with the 50 years of India's independence uh, is very negligible, it's very dismal. And there's definitely something wrong somewhere. In spite of the fact that there have been all political will on all the political parties, they have been putting it in their manifestos, they have been talking about the rights of women and protection of women, yet they haven't made it, there must be something wrong. So what you're saying in effect is that you weren't in favor of reservations, but you ended up feeling that reservations was the only way to solve the problem. Exactly. That is not the only way, but the best way at the present situation. Tell me something, you talked about the dismal representation of women in parliament in India. For the record, because you know these figures, how adequate or, or how inadequate is the representation? It is very inadequate. It's 7.2 percent is very in inadequate. If you compare that the 50 percent of the population, if not 51, uh, population of this country is women. You mean out of 50 percent of the population, only 7.2 percent of parliament is women? Yes. Which means to say that political parties and within political parties, the leaders of political parties have done very little to find women candidates. No, I would not say that way. There have been a kind of a system which made women to come in to work as a workers, I mean as field workers. In every political party, I can say from the Congress party for which I was a general secretary, that there are women who are in our wings who have been working. There have been women in every political party has got a women's wing. And they have been active over there. They have been active in trade union movements. But why then haven't they become MPs and that MLAs? Is because there is a mindset, you know. The political people, the players feel, if we put a woman, she may not make it. She, she would be defeated. Or sometimes there are other reasons. But let's, let's be honest. We're talking about a male mindset, aren't we? Women don't feel like this. Yes, because generally they are the ones who are the leaders, you know. So that's why it is not happened. It's only at one point of time when Rajiv Gandhi became the leader and he was the prime minister, maximum women came both in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. How many women did we have then? I won't have exact figures, but they were, I think it was about 10 percent. Even then, it's 10%. a negligible number. Yeah, but it was quite a jump from, you know, we are not taking from... Uh, taking it as that because 10 percent was better than seven and a half percent in any case and other thing is that you know why women don't come into it because election is not an easy process you need a lot of money and resources and I don't think it's very easy for but women elections to get are as difficult for men as they are for women I agree with you but and if men can difficult. get money then women should get money yes but men are generally in our country are more resourceful because they are the earning people but women are not being given that economic independence also. 
But if we want them to be economically independent, it will take a long time for them to be economically independent. You think we have to wait another 50 years for that? You know, you are not just a woman. You are also one of the leading political figures in our country. Can you speak honestly and openly on this subject? I am speaking very honestly and openly. Then tell me something. Would you agree that to a great extent it's male political leaders of all parties who have not done enough to push women and to give them a hand to get into parliament? I would be dishonest if you say that to you because it was the male political leaders who brought the 33% reservation bill in the parliament and got it passed. Uh, for did our they bring panchayat. it themselves or did they bring it under pressure from no, women's groups and mochas? No, no. The, the panchayat bill which was passed in the parliament was initiated by the leadership. As I said, it was brought by Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. It was defeated in the house once. And then again it was brought back and it was passed uh, unanimously. So I would not blame. You see, I'm not the kind of a person who sits and divides it into two boxes. Uh, men are like this and women are like this. Not that. The system have been like this. The development have been like this. Men have tried. And fortunately, in our country, all the feminist leaders were men, not women. Those <laughs> what, who, what do you mean by that? <laughs> it was Gandhiji. It was Maharishi Karve. It was all those <coughs> leaders at that time who fought for the rights of women. So the fight for the rights of women started by men, not by women. So I'm not one of those women who go on creating walls between men and women. We have to work together. And if there are any inhibitions, if there are any mindset, if there are any reservations in the mind of men due to whatever fear they have, we have to try to solve them and try to give them the confidence that if we come into politics, we are going to help the party, we are going to help the country, we are going to enhance what they want to do. But you're, but you're still saying to me that historically speaking in the last 50 years you think men have done enough, male politicians, male leaders of political parties have done enough to help women. You have no problem with the amount they've done. No. Uh, perhaps they tried their best, but they couldn't achieve the result. They did, did they try with commitment? Sure they did. If then they why did, did they fail? They failed because there are some historical reasons. But due to male chauvinism. This, you may put it if you like. You are a man, you can understand it better than I do because I don't have... I don't have any chauvinism but that's the point, that's the point I was making, that it's the male chauvinism that's inherent in political leaders that actually stopped women from achieving their rightful representation. We are not discussing here men are chauvinist or women are less. We are discussing here how to make 50% population of this country a participant in decision making and policy making. Because any decision which is made in the parliament or a state legislature affects men as much, as much as it affects women. Which is why so many of them are opposed to women's reservation. No, it is not that. There are other reasons. What are the other, other reasons? Other reasons I told you because they are the, the, the most important reason is that there is their resources are an important reason. And the women, the confidence in men that the women will make it is another reason. You see, we cannot decide, I can't tell you yes or no. This is the reason, this is not the reason. It is an issue which is not only prevalent in India. It is all over the world. Can anybody sit and decide why this party won, why this party didn't win? Why women are there, why women are not there? There are many reasons which are working in it. When, when women's rights, and in particular the historical women's suffragette movement in Britain to give them the vote was coming up around the turn of the century, people openly said that men don't want women to vote particularly male political leaders, because they suffer from a male chauvinist complex. But it's Britain, it's not India. In India, we never had this problem. And I'm very happy that we, when we got our independence, uh, it, was, it is part of our constitution and our commitment. Can I ask you a naughty question? Yes. Is it Najma, the woman, who's saying that men have not been a problem? Or is it Najma, the politician? I have no contradiction as Najma, the politician, and Najma, the woman. Because my life is an open book. I have nothing to hide. Political uh, ambitions have nothing to do with the fact that you no, don't want to blame political the, leaders. No, this is the reality which I'm telling you. And secondly, Karan, I am a scientist. And scientists are more forthright. You're also an outspoken woman. And today you're being very careful. No, I am outspoken. Uh, am I not speaking openly and plainly? Okay, let me, let me turn to another subject. There is a school of thought that argues 
that if reservations are the correct solution to help women get into parliament, yes. then for those women who have special discrimination, you need special reservations. Mm. What's your opinion? You see, why when I talk about reservation for women, I feel the women have been discriminated, they have been relegated, and they have not got the chance to come in. And out of these women, there are certain more disadvantaged women who live in the rural area, who never had the advantage, which is perhaps I had it, of education, of being articulate, and having the access to resources and all that. There are many like me in the urban areas. Now, we have to protect, when we want the reservation for women, we want all the women from different sections of society to be representing the parliament, because then the the voice of all those people will be heard in the parliament. Now, if I go and contest from a constituency, which is a rural constituency, definitely any rural woman would be disadvantaged against me because I will be more articulate, I will have more resources, I will be more accessible to them, and all those things. So this will be a disadvantage against them. I would rather like to protect this, this section of the women also, and we would like them to get into the parliament. Now, what is the methodology would be used for it? which uh, the way they would like to get it, it depends on, it can be discussed and um, talked about how they, it should be done. And those who have got these fears, the fears are not uh, without basis. There are so what you're saying is you can understand the fear, you can understand the yes. need for help. It's the methodology you're questioning. Exactly. So you're not really sure whether you need special reservations, but you need to do something to help them. Something has to be done. Do some you have any idea of your own what would that something be, what that something should be? Well, in the dialogue should be started first, because when you discuss, you can find out the method to get these people in. When you say the dialogue should be started, is this a dialogue within women themselves, or is it a dialogue no, between, nationwide? Between women themselves and between those people who have got these fears. because. As I said right from the beginning, it is not just to get the women into the parliament. That's not the end. This is the beginning. And the beginning for the rest of the future that these women should be equal participant in decision making and policy making and policy commitment also. So when we want to do it, they, if they start with a confrontation, with a bad feeling, it's not going to work. It will be counterproductive. Yes, it will be counterproductive. Okay, one last question. What do you say to people who turn around and say women's reservation may enhance the number of women in parliament but because it will be seen as a sort of backdoor entry no one's going to take those women MPs seriously I don't agree with it this is a method we have different electoral colleges we have different ways of getting people elected at different places now this is another method to to remove this imbalance in our system once this imbalance is removed now, when they come to the parliament, they'll have to prove themselves. But we have to see that those women who come to parliament or to come to state legislature, they should have been given a training to understand how to work in a political Rajma system. Ji, at that point, we're going to have to take a commercial break. But I want to come back and tackle this question of women in politics and what they can achieve in a slightly different way in part two. Don't go away. We'll be back to continue this discussion with Dr. Heptola in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Nazma Ji, in part one we were talking about women in politics and what can be done to help them, the need for representation and your views on the subject. It's all connected in a way with the need to give women their fair share and rightful place. Do you think in this 50th year of independence it would be right and fitting for a woman to be the next Vice President of India? It should have been in the first year of independence. It could have been then. So you mean we're 50 years too late? <laughs> Yes. I think so. We, we are 50 years too late for many a things, you know. Women should have been in much more positions than they are today. We, we could have done it. But anyway, 50th year could be a turning point. So you're saying better late than never? Yeah, sure. We have to start somewhere. Put your, put your future lenses on. Do you think we will have a woman vice president or is this just a lot of talk in the press? There are not many days to the elections, so you would see for yourself. I am not a uh, astrologer to predict, but definitely there is a demand from every quarter that a woman should be given a responsibility. Do you think a woman vice president would be a fitting thing, or would it be just tokenism? 
No, it is not a question of tokenism. A men's uh, vice president could also be a tokenism. Why then a question of giving a position to a woman, this, this question of tokenism comes? Aren't they capable enough? Haven't we seen many women in our country who have done their job the best? Haven't we got the best example of Mrs. Gandhi, who was not only a leader in India, but internationally she was respected, accepted, world class, um, safe woman? So a woman vice president, if we have one, would be the right and fitting thing and it wouldn't be tokenism? No, it would be as good as a man. Or maybe better, who knows? Then let me try and ask you the golden question that everyone wants to hear an answer to. The papers say that you are the front runner for the presidency today. Are you a candidate? You are from the media. You know it better than I would. Well, I'm going to keep speculating because that's the job <laughs> of a media man. But are you a candidate? Well, in our party, in our system, it is the party who decides. There could be many aspirants for many posts. But his final decision is the party. The party decides who is the most fitting, the most uh, useful, the best, and they would do it. If the party opts to make you their candidate, would you stand happily for the job? Who would not? Is it a job you want? The job I have been doing as a deputy chairman is I only know one job, and that is as a presiding officer of the parliament for last Many year. people say that that job is the perfect training ground for the future vice president? Uh, in a way, yes, to preside over the house, because I have, uh, I have presided this house with seven prime ministers, and a number of uh, parliamentary affairs ministers and leaders of the various political parties. So it's, it's, it's kind of a habit to me. I can, I, this house, running a house, I only know that job. But you know, Lakshmi, many people say that the vice president's job is probably a very boring job. You are not just one of the most educated of politicians, but you, in fact, have a PhD at the age of 22, yes. right? So why do you want the job? No job in this world is boring if you don't, if you don't, make, it, if you don't make it boring. Uh, the deputy chairman's job, nobody ever thought that is a very fascinating job. They think the ministerial job is more fascinating. But I felt very happy to be deputy chairman, and that's why I, I enjoyed it. And basically, I'm a person who, whichever job I take, I enjoy it. Can I be naughty for a second time? Yes. Is the vice president's job of interest because the vice presidency is of interest? Or is it a stepping stone five years later to the presidency? No, I don't. Uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, I look at the job which is in hand. If a person involves oneself into the job, for example, I'll tell you, Karan, uh, as a presiding officer, it is expected that the deputy chairman would be presiding the house when the chairman goes away and sit in the house, say, sit down, get up, speak, don't speak, and if there is acrimony to adjourn the house, try to settle and come back. But I have, a, I have gone beyond that. I thought I have a very advantageous position as a presiding officer. I have an access to all the political parties and leaders. They have confidence in me. So I thought, why not act as a catalyst between the, the NGOs and the government, for example. So you've decided that you want to get things done and you're going to use your office to do that? Yes. I, I thought this is the best way. For you're example, an activist in that sense. So surely I call myself an activist if you put it in that sense because I am an activist for the women's rights. I am an activist for the for those people who are disadvantaged. Like I, I can talk about environment. I have done things for environment. I've done things for people who are suffering with AIDS. I have sensitized people about the social securities. So and those would be, forgive my interrupting you, but those would be great strengths and qualities you would bring to the vice presidency also, wouldn't they? I don't know what the future will have in store for me, but these are the things I've already done as a deputy chairman. And, and will always continue to do, no matter where I'll you are. Yeah, wherever I am, I'll continue to do, because these are my commitments. The, uh, not only nationally, but internationally, I have enhanced this position, because I was chairing the Environment Committee of the Interparliamentary Union. You said that it all depends upon whether you get your party's candidature. Suppose I were to say to you, your party says you are the best person for the job. Does that give you confidence? I think it will give confidence to anyone else also. If the party says that you are the candidate, they will have the confidence. Do you have the feeling that if you become the Congress party's candidate, all the other parties, because they count in this election, would also support you? I mean, have you got good relations with them at the moment? I have had very good relations. Otherwise, how would I got elected? When I got elected the last time in 1988, and since then I am there, and again I was re-elected, uh, 
Congress didn't have the majority in the House. How I got elected? So it was your ability to get on with all politicians, regardless of parties, that has given you your present position. I would rather put it the other way. It's their confidence in me that they thought that I am unbiased, I am sensible, I am educated, I do my job well. And that is, uh, that is the strength a person should have. That's what I expect. Everybody also should feel in their own jobs what they are doing, that they have the confidence. You're being understandably modest and reluctant, and I can understand why, but I get the feeling I'm talking to the future Vice President of India. <laughs> it's, you are free to, uh, to think whatever you like. Can I then but ask you a hypothetical question? Yes. If you were to become, and I stress the word if, uh -huh. would you bring the same commitment, the same activism, so that it's not just a ceremonial Vice Presidency when you become Vice President, but it's one that's meaningful? Sure, because I have had the experience I mean, it's a hypothetical you are asking. I will give a hypothetical answer to you. Um, I know this house for last uh, 17 years as a member, but as a presiding officer, I know it for last 12 years. And I know what are the strength of democracy and what more strong democracies can emerge in the country, how we can strengthen the standard of debate, uh, in, uh, improve the level of debate, and the subject which should be taken. There are many subjects which are above party lines. You know, they, they are above the party. They are national issues. And you will stand for those subjects yes, and do because, whatever you can? Yes. For example, population. We environment? Should, environment, health. population, health, women, education. I'm also the um, uh, honorary uh, distinguished ambassador for human development of the UN. Dr. Hathura, a lot of people hearing you will suddenly be delighted because although we're talking hypothetically, yes. and I stress that, nonetheless, you are saying that you are going to bring a new vigor, a new dynamism, and an above party political activism to raise subjects of importance. That's what you're really saying, aren't you? Well, when you say hypothetical, yes. I have, I'm not saying what I will do, when I will be what. I'm only saying what I have done, when I am, and what position. So what we are looking at, or what I'm looking at, <laughs> is a future vice president, because I think you're going to be the vice president, who's going to be a different type of vice president. I won't compare. Everybody has their own individualities, their own priorities. Unfair question, because if you compare yourself, you're saying you're better. But I'm yes, saying different. Different, yes. Because everybody has their own, own uh, way of doing things, their own uh, thinking, in their own perceptions. They, they have, we have had very eminent people in That's the country. That's been the greatest hallmark of Najma Heptullah, that there's always been the Najma stamp, a mixture of the feminine touch, the intelligent touch, the balance, and wit. And you've been a character. People noticed it. Will the Najma touch continue as vice president? Or will you get subsumed under the system and just become a figurehead? <laughs> it depends on individuals. So it's going to continue? Wherever I am, I tell you one thing. One never knows what the future uh, has for, in store for anybody. As, we, as children, you must have also learned, the future is not asked to see ke sara sara, what will be, will be. And my attitude in life has been, when I reach the river, I know how to cross it. Because I already planned out how am I going to make the bridges crossing over the river. It is not that I will sit on the, on the side of the river and say, should I swim or should I get drowned or should I try to get somebody to take me in a boat? So everybody plans a future, uh, a future action, what one wants to do for people. Najmaji, don't go any further because that metaphor, as you put it, was so beautiful. Let's set it whole. You've reached the river. I can see the bridge being built. I can see that you're going to cross it. Next time we talk, let's hope you're on the other side. But we're going to have to leave it till then. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week with another interviewee. But for today, from the residence of the Deputy Chairman of the Rajya Sabha, Najma Heptullah in New Delhi, goodbye.